The 30 carbine is a very important round in the history of firearm development. Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. I hope you're ready because we're going to take a little bit of a strange ride down the paths of history and we're going to find out what in the world the three musketeers have to do with this. In today's video, we're going to talk about the history of the 30 carbine cartridge, not the M1 carbine I just held up. That particular one is made by the Universal Company and there's a lot of them out there, meaning the M1 that were made by a ton of different manufacturers. The challenge when I started to put all of this together is not to confuse the history of the weapon system with the caliber because they are synonymous. Also, I just held up one of the more iconic figures of World War II and Korea and perhaps for some even into the Vietnam War. But back to the Three Musketeers. For you aristocrats out there, this would be a carbine. Now, in World War II training videos, I'm not making this up, they referred to it as the 30 carbine. So, we're going to say carbine because the etymology of that word goes all the way back to the late 15 and early 1600s. Carbine meant, in French, mounted musketeer. And interestingly enough, that's important to us because what a mounted musketeer actually needed was a lot lighter and shorter rifle than you would typically find of the day. There are some people who believe that the term actually came from an area in Italy that specialized in making small guns, but that's at this point disproven. What's not up for debate is the fact that as long as there have been firearms, depending on your role, on the battlefield, you needed something smaller, easier to wield, that still did an effective job. This has been true all throughout the centuries and became very true in the late 1930s. Germany of the period was already developing smaller, lighter weapons for their paratroopers, and the United States, not to be outdone, decided that they needed a more powerful cartridge than they could get in, say, your 1911 firing the 45 ACP. Another option they had at the time was the Thompson submachine gun, which was very heavy and lacked potential reach out range. So, at the behest of the United States government, Winchester developed what became known as the 30 carbine cartridge. What it was was a modification of their already existing 32 self-loading cartridge, which one could find in a Winchester Model 1905. The problem was that everybody that was submitting weapons designs for the caliber, they were always too heavy. So what ended up happening was, and this is actually this guy's real name, a fellow named Carbine Williams scaled down an M1, used the rotating bolt system, and it actually maximized the effectiveness of the 30 carbine cartridge. The first one is a 110 grain full metal jacket round from Wolf in 30 carbine. Next to it is a 110 grain hollow soft point from Winchester of a pretty old variety, but it's typical of what you would find in the sporting cartridge line for the 30 carbine. And next to it is a 38 special round I threw in there so people can get some sort of scale or sizable reference between the calibers. From a technical sense, the 30 caliber carbine is 7.62 by 33 millimeters it fires a 110 grain cartridge at roughly 2,000 feet per second, giving it almost 1,000 foot-pounds of energy at the muzzle. What I found interesting about that fact when I was putting all of this together is, depending on the sources that you read, the 30 carbine caliber is notoriously weak. In fact, there's not a lot of data to suggest anybody actually doing much with it in World War II and Korea beyond 50 yards. And I did find sources that stated in the heavy winter clothing that Chinese soldiers would wear during the Korean conflict, it didn't really do much at all. Yeah, it might eventually put them out of the fight, but was not immediately capacitated. For me, what I'm hoping to do when we do the range portion of the caliber is to see potentially why that would be. Because if you look at it from a mathematical point of view, it should have plenty of neutralization power, but all of that remains to be seen in a later video. 
Before the 1940s were out, in fact, in 1944, Smith & Wesson actually submitted a hand ejector revolver to fire the caliber. I'm not sure if that's why there's some confusion about whether or not this was developed for or as a pistol round, but is in fact not true. You can tell, and one of the reasons why I brought the 38 Special is because it looks similar. But it's a straight intermediate rifle cartridge designed to be used in a small lightweight rifle. Now, the 44 that they had in 1944, the Smith model that they submitted to the government had lots of problems. A huge flash when fired from a revolver, and it wasn't very accurate. These are some of the same problems that it still experiences as a pistol or revolver cartridge. In fact, there are people that modify loads to take the flash and the bang away when fired from a handgun. There were lots of manufacturers that made weapons with that caliber, including Taurus. Iver Johnson made one they called the Enforcer, and it had a little bit of a folding stock and ended here. And it was a really intimidating and cool looking weapon system. And there's still a lot of those available commercially for collectors or people that just want to see what the caliber is all about. Right up until the modern era, Ruger makes Blackhawks, and as we mentioned, the Taurus Raging 30. I've never personally fired one from a handgun, but from talking to people that, I, that have, it's definitely an experience and you could light a cigar with the fireball coming off the end of the cartridge. Now, in my humble opinion, the 30 carbine is a very important round in the history of firearm development because, one, it satisfied a need that was always there. Some may argue it didn't do it very well, but I would suggest to you that you have to start somewhere and probably gave birth to the idea of the AR pistol platforms that are so popular today. That idea that you need small in a tight space or for perhaps rear echelon and untrained troops, the ability to reach out just a little farther, say if you were at an airfield security team. Interestingly enough, the Air Force was the first one to adopt Eugene Stoner's M16 for that very reason. Yes, it was longer, obviously, than most carbines, but you can see sort of the bones of the project that gave birth to some awfully respectable weapon systems as time went on. I look forward to testing 30 carbine on the range, and I've hoped you'll enjoy these little factoids about how it got its name and what its future might be.